Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and welcome to the Nautel Fall webinar series. I'm Jeff Welton, and today we're going to be talking about tips and tricks for engineers and managers. I'm joined today by Paul Freeman Tinkle. Paul's the President and General Manager of Thunderbolt Broadcasting down in Tennessee. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. It's uh, great to be on to talk about the industry that I love, the industry I've grown up in, and the industry I continue to learn from. Excellent. Now, a couple of housekeeping things before we start. There is a place where you can put questions in your control panel. There is a little arrow that you can expand the control panel. If you don't see one on your screen, you put the questions in and we'll try to answer them as we go along. Anything we don't have a chance to answer before the end of the webinar, we will certainly get back to you in an email afterwards. Okay, remember that if you're an SBE member, the completion of one of our webinars qualifies for half of a recertification credit under category I of the research schedule. Okay, so that's uh, also useful. On that note, let's get rolling. So the category is 50 tips and 50 tricks. Uh, I've done this presentation a few times. Paul does a, a wonderful one geared more toward management and ownership. And so what we've done for this webinar, we're alternating be an engineer and a manager and an engineer and, a ma and et cetera and so on. So without uh, further ado, everybody that knows me knows that we start off every conversation with keep it cool and keep it clean. Uh, cool clean transmitters or cool clean anything will tend to last a whole lot longer. This webinar will be archived on our YouTube channel so you'll be able to get to it through the resources tab of our website. So you don't need to bother writing all the math down but this way you've got it in one convenient place for later. Just gives you a fast way to figure out your power consumption and the waste heat you're generating so you know your cooling requirement. Okay, uh, one other tip on Paul's side, and I'll let Paul carry on with this one. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. You know, the one thing that people like myself, and I am not an engineer, I'm probably not even near close, but I do understand a lot about engineering. And the one thing that makes it so simple for anyone who goes into the transmitter besides the engineer is having things correctly labeled. And the best way to do that is to get you a label maker and uh, label everything that you possibly have. And, you know, I like to label things that I've installed. Uh, if, it's a, if it's an IP address and it's on the front of a transmitter, then it's easy to find. It just makes things so much easier. And that includes uh, inside your electric box uh, your breaker box, uh, you know, what switch controls the transmitter, which switch controls the blower, and all of these kinds of things. And if you'll do that, and then put it uh, both on the front and the back, put your serial number on the back of the equipment as well as on the front, makes it so much easier. And what the thing happens to be in the rack, whatever that piece of equipment is, label it what it is. If it happens to be an STL, put STL on it. Those are the kinds of things that make life so much easier for someone that might have to come in behind an engineer or another engineer that happens to come in and hasn't seen that piece of equipment before. Excellent, thanks Paul, and that is a very good point. I see uh, we've got our first question. I've been expecting this question uh, about flash player going away and I uh, did take that slide out of here just because I was trying to keep this presentation more general and less Nautel centric. But the short answer is, if you go to the website, there is a flash page on the website. And Stuart, at the end of the day, I'll uh, send you a link to that page, which gives you the schedule on how we plan on taking care of that. So the plan is in place already. Okay, my next topic, always, always, always grounding, grounding. I love talking about grounding. Uh, we're not going to hit too much on it here, except to remember that keep your ground leads as short and straight as possible. If you look at the photo in the lower left, the ground leads are looping around, adding unnecessary inductance. If the uh, leads came straight into the top side of the panel, you'd uh, actually improve the grounding significantly. The other thing is where you have to use a clamp connection, like on a ground bus, where when you're installing it, uh, put some Nolox or some antioxidant on the uh, copper so that as it uh, oxidizes, it doesn't uh, tend to uh, doesn't tend to corrode and uh, increase the ground resistance. Um, Aaron Reed made a comment on the labeling uh, about uh, putting the local IP address, username, and password on the front of the equipment. 
and uh, definitely is. He, he mentions the security risk to it, and, and he's right. But in a closed system like a uh, transmitter site where typically you're not going to have a webcam online at it, you hope, then uh, it, it's not a bad idea. And that way, somebody getting called in to do engineering, as Paul was mentioning, has got a uh, fast way to uh, see what's going on. Well, another right. way of doing that, uh, Jeff, is, uh, and this is pretty simple, just have a master piece of paper with all the uh, critical information written down and have it in a book. And we can talk about that later. But uh, we like to know that, uh, and we don't have the cameras in there, so we know we're pretty safe and secured. And uh, we've got double locks and some other security measures on our tower sites, which is something else we can always talk about. Yeah, and uh, we do have the logbook coming up in a couple of slides. So I'll let you carry on with meter readings because this is something else useful for management and engineering. Yeah, one of the things about um, here at our uh, stations in West Tennessee, here in Martin and Union City, Tennessee, we still have our people to take meter readings. And the reason for that, it familiarizes them with the equipment. They know what they're looking for. And if something goes awry, at least we've got a paper trail on it. And I know you don't have to take meter readings, but uh, these new people that are coming in, it gives them a feel that they're really in the business. But more importantly, someone can come in from behind, take the readings, look at it, uh, whether or not the power has gone down. Uh, you know, if you're 7,000 watts and it's fallen down to 5,100, and that happened at our place here just recently, uh, it's pretty easy to see, hey, uh, Mr. Tinkle, the power seems to have gone down. And that way somebody is brought forward if it doesn't already have a call out from the transmitter to say that you've uh, you've uh, lost some power. Yeah, that's a, a really, really good idea. And uh, I mean, we've all heard the stories about the jocks that have to do the hourly meter readings and they just write down the last set of readings. But uh, if you've got them trained right and they uh, start uh, start keeping them regular, then they will tend to come to you if they see something wrong. All right, the other thing that uh, I like, and I mentioned it earlier a little bit in the grounding slide was uh, Checking connections, I love these uh, little infrared cameras. You can get them, the, the one shown here, a FLIR attaches right onto the, the uh, port in the bottom of your cell phone. They make them for both Android and iOS. They're about 200 bucks. And you walk into your transmitter site or your studio, you take a picture of the breaker panel and you can see at a glance if you've got a hot breaker. Perhaps it's got a loose connection in it. Maybe it's drawn more current than it should be. Just anything like that. Also, anything with uh, compression connections, terminal blocks, uh, wire going into a compression connector. On a fairly regular basis, you should go through and tighten those sorts of things down just to make sure they uh, stay uh, stay nice and uh, secure. Uh, and Jeff, let me go back to an old-fashioned way of doing it. Just touch yeah. the breakers uh, on, the, on the wall. Just feel it. See if any of them happen to be warm, and if they are, you know, get your electrician in there and have him or her to come and to take a look at it. And you are absolutely right. That FLIR is a, is a, is a godsend. Yeah, and that, that is a really good point. Typically, a breaker will give you a fair amount of warning before it gets to the dangerous point. And uh, definitely, you'd, uh, you'd notice just uh, running the, the, your palm or your fingertips down the, uh, down the breakers on the panel. Um, make sure that the cover is on the panel. When you do this, please, folks, we don't uh, want to yeah. read any of any be in the trade magazines. Exactly. Okay. Paul, do you want to address EAS? Well, you know, there's a lot to be said. And by the way, have we gotten the update or the upgrade from Sage yet? Has anybody heard uh, whether that's uh, been released? I know they were working on it. We're supposed to have it in here by the 1st of November. But, you know, one of the things that people uh, continue to harp on and the people that are doing the harping are the FCC and the, a the alternate broadcast inspection uh, program people. And that's to make sure that your, uh, your EAS is working properly. And uh, obviously, it's got to be upgraded uh, if you haven't already uh, received an upgrade, and we have it, to, to my knowledge. But um, having a real strong paper trail will keep any radio station out of the uh, woods with the FCC. And I have gone through, I think, six, five or six, uh, however long they've been doing it. We were one of the early people that adopted this. But uh, when you have these uh, broadcast inspections that take place, they want to see that you're doing it. They want to make sure that you know how to run an EAS test, and they also want to make absolutely sure that it's being documented. And that's why and we have an EAS paper trail here. 
and uh, we have instructions on how to run an EAS test. So many radio stations, particularly the smaller and even the medium market stations, don't have anything written down. They've got somebody that goes in and pushes the button. But if an inspector walks in and says, run me an EAS test, they may not even know where the box is. That's another thing about labeling it. Even if it's got the word SAGE on it, you need to have the word EAS, and you've got to be able to have something to push that button to know how to start it. So um, we do ours uh, on a computer in the control room, but obviously it can still be done manually right there at the SAGE uh, digital uh, uh, index box. All right, and I've gotten uh, several comments. Uh, Mark, Aaron, Tim, Jerry, thanks very much, saying no update yet for the SAGE. And Aaron sent me an email about the extension on the uh, on the um, shoot. I'm trying to read this and uh, cover the uh, control at the same time. I, got, I haven't got enough brain cells. The extension on the cert. So uh, there is an extension, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, not out yet. All right. So one other thing we want to talk about a little bit. We're getting on to that time of year. I know uh, one of the cats came up yesterday very cheerfully smiling with a mouse in her face and uh, proceeded to play hockey with uh, the two dogs and right up until we saw one of them or the mouse uh, get cornered and stood up on its hind legs to the big dog's nose. And uh, anyway, that dog's not gonna be a mouser. But it's time to start critter proof in our facilities. And the one thing that people talk about is uh, putting the, uh, the steel wool in, well, remember to use stainless steel or copper wool because uh, regular steel wool will oxidize and disintegrate and then they'll just chew right through the, uh, the expanded foam and uh, you haven't really gained anything. Remember too- Let, me, let me jump on that, Jeff, with you for just yeah. one second. Uh, critters uh, usually come in for one of two reasons, whether it's mice or others, and that's to get something to eat. And if you're if you're eating in your transmitter building or if you're eating in the radio station where the transmitters are, just be aware that that stuff needs to go in the trash after you're done with it because they can smell anything. And a lot of engineers like to go, go to Subway and then go out to the tower site and they'll sit down and have their drink and chips and Subway sandwich and then put it in the trash. Well, no matter how deep the trash is, they have a tendency to find that stuff, particularly mice, they can climb anywhere they want to. So yeah. uh, take your trash home with you. Empty your trash regularly from your tower site. Get rid of the old uh, 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 filters that you have thrown in the trash can. Take them with you and dump them out and put a new trash bag in there. That'll help as well. That's a really good point, Paul. And since you brought up tower sites, it's a good time. Whoops, I think I skipped the slide here. Back up. No, I didn't. Okay, good. Uh, visual well, inspection. What do you like to yeah. see there? Yeah, you know, the thing that I'd say, and this is, this goes back to, I'm an owner, I'm a manager, I'm a janitor, I'm all of the same, but uh, I do a personal inspection on our stuff at least once a month, and uh, our tower site, that the picture you're looking at on the top on the right-hand side of that ATU unit, I mean, that's that's just un, totally uncalled for, and uh, there's no reason in the world that you can't spend some money and buy a weed eater or have somebody to go in and clean it out and make it look good. Beep. Be proud of your site. Ask yourself, is this the site that I want to bring my competitor over to and let them see how nice our place looks? You know, those isocouplers, uh, they need to be looked at to make sure there's nothing going south on those. ATU box, open it up, take a look and see if there's anything inside the antenna tuning unit uh, box. And tower anchors, see if somebody, you know, you never know when somebody's gonna run over it accidentally. Uh, maybe you've got somebody mowing your yard, and we do, and you want to make sure that those things are well established. And if you're hiring somebody to come do your work, make sure they know what they're cutting, what they're trimming, and how close they need to be uh, before they get to a guide wire or something else. Um, you know, neatness is the most important thing. I had an FCC uh, fellow tell me the other day, oh, it's been a couple of months ago, he says, Paul, he says, the radio stations that are neat and organized, he says, we know they're doing their job. Those are the ones that we don't worry as much about as when we go and see something like what we're looking at on the picture there. Yeah, and uh, this particular one, it was uh, kind of interesting. That picture came back from my tech support days, so 15 years ago or more. 
And uh, it was a transmitter that every morning when they turned it on, a day timer, it uh, was shutting back with reflected power. And it would uh, continue to do that for about an hour and then it would work all day. And what it was to do on the uh, vines was shorten the base insulator. Um, one other note about uh, EAS, just jumping backwards a bit, uh, Aaron Reed sent me a little note that he uh, sends his remote weekly tests automatically every Tuesday, but he also sends another one sort of random uh, when he does the weekly review of the station log, and that one's done manually, so you can sort of automate and still manually uh, train your employees on how to send the tests. One of the things that we do, we do ours manually that way. We can stop the programming and just simply say, this is a test of the emergency alert system, boom. And then 10 mm -hmm. seconds, you're in and out and start it back again. Exactly. Now, on the topic of ferrites, and anybody anybody who's heard me talk already is out there chuckling. It's like, yeah, we knew he was going to bring these in here. Uh, ferrites on their own are not a solution. But with good grounding and surge protection, they can help increase the effective impedance of the equipment and make it a less viable path to uh, ground for a lightning surge. So by all means, use the ferrites. With our gear, we provide them. Provide them. You can get them pretty cheap from uh, companies like Amidon, uh, A-M-I-D-O-N. Uh, if you Google Amidon and ferrite, uh, you'll, you'll find them. And uh, they're primarily ham oriented, but RF is RF for the purpose of lightning protection. So I think it's very important that, uh, uh, yeah, at the same time on those uh, ferrites. So here we go. So Paul, you'd made a note in your uh, tips about spare keys. Yeah, let me bar, Let me go back a click if you will, Jeff. Uh, you just brought up something very important. When those uh, ferrites are installed, they've got to be installed correctly. Yeah, and if you don't follow the factory. Small. Okay, so. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll carry on until Paul comes back. I see he's uh, not on at the moment. No, but, I'm on. Uh, the spare I'm keys on. are something that we will always, always, always hit a time when you just can't find your keys, whether they're yeah. locked somewhere or the rare occasion, not so rare maybe, you lock them in the building. Uh, I've seen stuff like that happen before as well. So by all means, you should have the, uh-oh, so there I see Paul is on and I'm not hearing him. Everybody else, I can hear Paul. Oh, great. So it's my end. Yay, me. Okay, right. can well, you hear me okay? Paul talk and uh, he can talk about the keys and we're going to have to figure out how we work this where I cannot hear Paul. Okay, uh, Jeff, I'm sorry you can't hear me. Uh, and if someone else can let Jeff know that I'm being heard, that's fantastic. I just made a mention a moment ago about the ferrites, and I think one of the most important things that Jeff taught me is that those ferrites need to be installed correctly, particularly with any Nautel transmitter, or you may have a, a hiccup that you don't want to have a, a hear about. Keys. Uh, there's two or three things you can do on keys, at least we do. I've gone to all of the master locks uh, that um, have the numbers on them. Uh, it just makes it easier for everybody. It's the same standard code for all of our transmitter sites, and that makes it real simple. I also uh, have uh, many times I've hidden keys. Uh, I was with a, a great broadcaster out in Wyoming here a couple of years ago. We drove all the way up to the mountain, all right, and I'm he forgot to, to have keys. The audio here, just one so, moment. I can hear you, Jeff. Okay, I'm hearing a little background noise, so I'm hoping that we're going to this is Paul hear here. something. But I think I'm good. okay. I hear Paul now. We got her back. I'm Very not good. sure exactly what happened there. I just switched my microphone off or your headset off and on again, but we appear to be good. Okay, so you got the keys done? Yes. All right, very good. So the next thing we like to see is a little bit of safety, folks. Uh, everybody's seen these pictures before, a voltage tester, grounding wand. By all means, if you don't have a grounding wand at your site, make one out of a broomstick and a set of jumper cables and some duct tape. 
but uh, there are all kinds of times when stuff like that, just the general safety stuff is so easy to overlook and it really, really needs to be dealt with. So uh, certainly look at the safety issues. I'm uh, uh, going to talk a little more about that uh, down the road, but if you make it part of your mindset, it really tends to, uh, to become habitual pretty quickly. Okay, Paul, here's that log we were talking about. Oh yeah, this is uh, something that I have in every tower site um, here at the radio station also. We not only have a maintenance book, but the maintenance book, we have one for the generator. We also have a book for the inspection of the tower site, and we also have a quarterly inspection. Each of those are there. And I should have uh, taken a picture and sent you one, but uh, we have a shelf full of all of our equipment. Every every piece of equipment at the transmitter site has a book on it. So if it's the transmitter or if it happens to be the STL or anything else that we may happen to have, we've got a book on every single piece of equipment. And here at the studio, we have a whole library of everything that we have inside the radio station itself. But if you will take time and document whoever comes into the tower site and just log the things that need to be looked at, but more importantly, log in Jeff Welton here at 1123 Central and write down the tower uh, lights are on or off or write down the power, the transmitter, the plate voltage, the plate current, and those things, and the air conditioning system, whether it's on or off, all of those little things that are important to you write those down. Now what I did, we took uh, a uh, list of what needs to be looked at and put it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. I did one for each month. And that way when the engineer walks in, what he or she does, they walk in and they can go right through the list and put every piece of information in the little blanks. Where if it says PA volts, you write down the voltage. PA current, you write down the current. You know, did you test the generator? Yes, no. Did you test it online? Everything that I've got happens to be in here. And if you want a copy of this, just send me an email to Paul Tinkle at WCMT.com. Paul, P A U L, Tinkle at WCMT.com. And I'll be glad to send this to you. And that way you can have your own template and then make your own. So that's your bonus here for today. Yes, we have the license uh, in the books. And you see where it says store in a plastic container? Mice don't like plastic. So at least the mice that we've had, but it also helps to keep it in the event that you have some water leakage and those kinds of things. Jeff? Exactly. And uh, John Van Milligan makes a point too, for those of us that are uh, a little more electronically oriented, uh, they keep their log books on Google Drive so they can access them from anywhere. So that's a great, Mel it's a great piece of advice. Yes, sir. Yeah, and stepping backwards a bit, Chris Hill had asked uh, when shopping for ferrites, which mix should be used for best surge suppressant? Because we're using them for common mode suppression, where we've got a normally equal feed and return, we want them to suppress anything that's, uh, that's uh, on only the feed or the return. So the highest iron content you can get, uh, Typically, we use J material or uh, 43 material or the, the two numbers, and Amadon's website has both. They're, they're pretty much the same. If you look at a lot of spec sheets, they'll show a saturation frequency, and the lower the saturation frequency for lightning protection, the better. Okay, now one other thing on IT security is uh, change your default passwords. I've beaten this drum over and over. We've all seen news briefs where various things have been hacked just because the default username and password were there. And this comes back to that uh, security thing that Aaron was talking about earlier, where putting your username and password on the front of the equipment, if it's something that could conceivably be broadcast to the general public, whether it's on a webcam that could be hacked or whatever, is probably a bad idea. But definitely putting it in a in a notepad or something where you can get to it is a good idea. Just uh, don't leave the default username and password connected to the World Wide Web. And uh, yes, Aaron Shodan is your friend. Uh, Jim Jim Stowe had asked uh, Paul, could you repeat your email before you go into the spare parts slide? Sure. P a u l t i n k l e at w c 
C-M-T dot com. That's William Charles Mary Tom dot com. Thank you. We have a lot of spare parts, and I want to say something to all engineers listening today. Uh, if you need a spare part, get management on board. Give them a list of what you need. Show them what approximately it's going to cost. If the transmitter goes off and you don't have a tube sitting there to go right in top on top of the one that just died, you know that's the manager's fault. It's, but, it, but if you haven't told them you don't have a spare, then it's on you because you get into that argument of why they're off the air, you know, on Christmas Day. So uh, one of the things that we did is to make sure that we purchased the uh, Nautel spare parts kit for our J1000 transmitter. Little plug here for you, Jeff. And uh, Jeff even told me, he says, Paul, he says, we have a spare parts kit in in, uh, in um, Memphis. That's where our hub is uh, for West Tennessee. He says, uh, but I went ahead and we got some spare parts just in case some of the things go out. But the critical stuff is going to be what you see right there in that picture. There may be some other things. But if it looks like it's going to be um, uh, central to uh, on-air broadcast, what's going to keep you going in the event that your equipment happens to die? And that uh, Econco 4CX 1200A uh, those things aren't cheap, and you need to tell them up front, you know, this is what, what I need. I'm buying a, a rebuilt Econco tube to go into my transmitter, and uh, this is what we have to have because of the last one we have. And we make sure that you, by the way, when you put a new tube in, let it stay in there for three or four or five weeks before you send the other one off, just in case that one happens to be a dud. You never know. So give it some burn-in time. Very good. Now, the other thing, and uh, we're jumping back and forth in a bunch of stuff, but it keeps us all thinking. Uh, use a VPN. The screenshot here is from uh, one called Tunnel Bear. It's the one I use at home. It's, uh, it, it's free for up to a certain amount and then paid up above that. Uh, it'll depend on what you want to do, but uh, a VPN is some pretty good internet security. Now, again, you're not going to... Uh, you're not going to beat the person that uh, brings a USB stick and plugs it into your automation network with a corrupted file on it. So definitely uh, you do have to train folks about what can and can't be plugged into the networks at the office. But, uh, but at least practicing some basic security is, uh, is not nearly as expensive as it used to be. Okay, uh, Paul, uh, you want to address this? You'd mentioned survival kits and things like that. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff that um, I think when you're out in the woods at your tower site or up on a mountain or wherever it happens to be, but this is all pretty basic stuff that uh, every radio station tower site should have. And, um, you know, look at it. And you know, if you're missing something, I'm looking for flashlight. I don't see one there, but I'm also looking for spare batteries and you know, obviously you want to have toilet paper and paper towels and some drinking water, uh, but those are just critical to, you know, having to spend the night at the radio station tower. And we have a cot at our tower sites because sometimes engineers get tired. And uh, I don't mind telling you, uh, I'd rather be off the air and have my engineer alive instead of on the air and trying to fix something and then get hurt because they were uh, deprived of sleep. So. That's one of my rules, uh, no matter what. Uh, you know, the engineers are more important than any transmitter or any radio commercial or a good piece of production. We've got to take care of our people. Exactly. And I'm seeing some uh, different suggestions come in through questions about uh, putting some uh, white rice in the bag where the toilet paper is just to keep it dry and with some contact lens case and saline solution and various other things. I think we could probably do a whole other article about uh, the uh, survival kit. So that uh, may be a tips uh, article coming down the road. Now, one of the other things that uh, I talk about a lot is that uh, it goes both ways. Paul's really helping us out by uh, coming in and showing us how managers can talk engineer, but sometimes engineers need to learn to talk manager too. And you look at cost of operation, cost of ownership, um, the various non-quantitative factors like learning curve and uh, how much pain the certain solution or lack of solution is causing and there are going to be times when uh, you can uh, very certainly come out with a uh, dollars and cents reason why an upgrade makes 
a good idea, whether it's transmitter, whether it's various other things. So just uh, spend a little bit of time learning to get away from the, the watts, the volts, the ohms, and all that great stuff, and learning to talk ROI and uh, dollars and cents. It's, uh, it's definitely a good investment in your time. Okay, uh, Paul, you uh, mentioned cleaning filters, and this is something that my service guy interior really likes to hear an owner talk about. Um, I just uh, bought some new filters the other day uh, from a factory, but uh, one thing that I will tell you, um, they're easy to overlook, but you, this is the stuff that makes uh, your transmitter, and there, you folks all know this, but you've got to keep, we change ours every 30 days. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. And if you don't, and I've got some that I take care of, I pull them out of the transmitter, I go to my home, I wash them out, and then I take them back. Uh, yes, it's a little bit of a headache to do that. You know, I run them up to McDonald's uh, on some smaller filters, but you've got to take care of those things. Uh, at your generator, uh, I don't know how many of you have a generator. We're fortunate to have one at every one of our sites. But... Uh, the thing that I tell people is just because you're checking the the uh, oil or maybe the fuel that you have in it, you also need to have someone come out at least once a year and just do a little look at it and you know, pay the service fee uh, unless you know how to do this stuff. Check the battery. Um, you know, some batteries still obviously have water in them, <clears throat> distilled water at that. So just, you know, you, you, that's part of my generator checkup list, by the way that I'll send yeah. whoever asked for one. And we'll, we'll get to that in a little oh, more detail in a bit, let me, too. Let me say one more thing about this. Uh, oh, you can keep your filters cleaner if you've got a shop vac at the tower site. You can mm -hmm. usually get some of that uh, residue of the dust or whatever it happens to be that you're getting sucked into your transmitter or before it gets into the transmitter. But every radio station tower site, and for that fact, every every radio station should have a shop vac so that they can get in there and do a good job of sucking out all the stuff that gets into your side of your transmitter. And Jeff, yep, since yep. you've been at ours, you know how I feel about a transmitter site. Mm -hmm. Yep, and cleaner definitely lives longer. Uh, one of the other things is networking. Things like uh, this webinar, uh, going to your SBE meetings, uh, state broadcast functions, uh, NAB if you can do it. But uh, anything you can do, I mean, Paul, I first heard your uh, 48 tips uh, presentation at the Arkansas Broadcaster Show. So, yeah, it's uh, important to get around. Yeah, and a lot of engineers uh, I have seen, and I've talked to Chris Daniel, and, and oh, I mean, I, I, I love engineers. I love engineers as much as I love my wife because they love talking about their industry. You want to get with people who you can share ideas with. And the most important thing I think each engineer needs to have is not a big ego. Be willing to say, I don't know how to fix this. Can you help me? Can you help me comes from getting to know people like the people that are here on this webinar. And you need desperately to have as many contacts in your phone. And you might even put down in your contact list if Joe Jones happens to be an expert on blank equipment, put him down as Joe Jones uh, Mosley or Joe Jones uh, whatever the next piece of equipment is. And that way you can always rely on somebody else that might be able to give you a hand on repairing something and save you a lot of time and trouble. And I go back to that word and word ego. Engineers love not to call somebody because I think it's a little bit embarrassing. I don't, I think it's reaching out and being able to solve the problem and learning how you solved it by just simply saying, hey, can you help me with this? So drop your ego and simply say help and somebody will be there to help you. Yeah, the good thing is between these things, uh, the Facebook Broadcasting Club, the Radio Transmitter Sites pages, uh, there are so many different forums out there that we can uh, find answers. So it does come in handy. Hey, look, Paul, shop back. Hey. End of conversation. You know what to do, folks. <laughs> exactly. Move on. Uh, so back to the IT section. Back your stuff up. Uh, you should do a full backup at least once a month. I mean, obviously, it'll depend how much stuff you've got to uh, to protect on how much of your uh, stuff is in data format versus not. But these days, I don't think I can remember the last time I walked into a facility that didn't have at least one computer in it. 
And you should do an incremental backup on a very, very regular basis. Ideally, these backups will not be stored in the facility because if you have a fire, then they're gone too. So just remember to back your stuff up as much as you possibly can. Now, Paul, we talked about flashlights and batteries a bit ago too. Yep, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And um, you want to make sure that you do have fresh batteries. And um, I hesitate to say this, but go out and buy a flashlight. Every room that you work in needs to have a flashlight. And by the way, label it for the room that it's supposed to be in. Flashlights get lost in radio station. They get lost, period. Uh, just put where it's supposed to be and who it belongs to on the on the flashlight, and it'll always be there when you need help. Engineers do not have enough flashlights in their in their bags. And one other thing that we've started going to, we've gone to LED lights. I love light in the transmitter, and you can't get enough light in a transmitter room or in a tower site. So consider doing LEDs if you can. Yeah, and for what it's worth, personal plug, that photo is the uh, battery drawer in the cabinet in my kitchen. Okay. Okay. Surge protectors, uh, I'd mentioned earlier talking about ferrites, that without a good surge protector, you uh, a ferrite on its own isn't going to do a whole lot. You need the surge protector to uh, provide the connection between the AC lines and ground. And remember, it goes both ways. So surge protector is bi-directional. If the tower gets hit and ground potential spikes way high, then it can uh, discharge out to the AC lines. But uh, by all means, uh, Paul, I'm pretty sure you've got surge protectors at all your facilities. I, I think I've seen them. Yeah, and that just goes back to common sense. Uh, you've got to take care of your stuff. It's like a UPS on interrupted power supply. Make sure it's plugged into surge and not just battery. Uh, little tiny things, uh, whether it's the big stuff or the little stuff, you know. And do a little walk around. If computer get if computers get moved in the radio station, unplugged, taken out, uh, maybe the service or whatever, make sure that they go back in the right slots in the uh, in the UPSs or the APCs, as you folks call them. Yeah, and on the note of walk arounds, you'd uh, talked a little bit in your presentation about uh, taking a look at your tower. Yeah, th this is this is something that's happened to me the other day. I've got a hiccup on. Uh, on one of my Burke systems, and we've about to determine uh, through process of elimination that uh, our box, our, what's that box called? The on-off box, <laughs> where you, the tower light uh, flashes inside and out, the mechanism, whatever that's called, I'm sorry. Yeah, but, right. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think one of the caps is going south, and we've had some, uh, we've had a couple of hiccups, but uh, one at 3.30 in the morning, imaginary that. Uh, but I will tell you this, um, anytime a tower light goes out, uh, we get the phone call from the tower. We document it. We also get the, um, we, we know the ASRN number, antenna structure registration number. And I pick up the phone and we've got a helicopter and ambulance service here in our community. So I pick up the phone and I call them and I say, hey, uh, our tower light's out at WCMTFM. It's over in South Fulton. It's in front of your path and I give them the uh, ASRN number, and that way they know that I care about them, and I don't want anybody slamming into my tower at night, or for that fact, in the daytime hours, period, uh, because we had an, uh, an outage and we didn't get it reported. So uh, make sure that uh, your people document it, call the, uh, what is it, Lockheed now that we call, and I, I still have it as FAA in my phone, and make sure you have your ASRN numbers in your phone so you know what tower site it is. You don't have to run out there to the tower to look on the side of the building and find out which one it happens to be. The ambulance people uh, in the sky really appreciate that phone call from you. And you may not have even thought about that before. But the last thing we want to do is to find out that somebody ran into one of our towers. And uh, whether that we had phoned a note of in, noticed airmen, or not. We just want to make absolutely positively sure that we're going to be doing all we can to make sure the people that fly those things don't slam into our tower. Yeah, that's a, a really good point, and it's uh, it's something that definitely bears repeating on a regular basis. I, I drive out, by the way, I drive out to the towers about once a month, and I just look at them to make sure that all the beacon, that both the, that the beacon is burning and the side lamps are burning too. You just never know. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, one other thing, uh, we it, this is just an audio sample rate thing, but too many sample rate conversions as we go more and more to digital audio are, are just bad. Uh, especially if you're running HD with the lower bit rates, uh, the fewer sample rate converters you can put in there, the better you will be, and it makes a huge difference in audio quality. Uh, especially up converters, you can't put the bits back once you've taken them out. So by all means, when you can, try to avoid sample rate conversions. Okay, uh, Paul, you talked to too about uh, NRSC measurements. Yeah, I think everybody knows that uh, if you don't, uh, this has to be done uh, every 12 months, no later than 14 months. And uh, it's just a matter of having somebody come out and take the readings that knows what they're doing with the uh, spectrum analyzer. Uh, I use Kevin Kidd. I think he's very, very good. He's in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. He comes over, does our test. I've documented it. We put it in the drawer. Obviously, it doesn't have to go into the online public file or in the old file cabinet, but it does have to be kept uh, for a period of uh, two years, I believe it is, but it has to be done every 14 months. You've got to make sure that you're on the right transmitting uh, frequency, and that's the most important thing. So um, it's pretty straightforward. And, you know, do your due diligence and take care of your stuff. Make sure you're not on somebody else's signal or yours is not uh, uh, deviating. And one other good note about this, because we do work to an international audience, although uh, NRSC is strictly a U.S.-based thing, almost every country as some standard for performance measurements. So whatever applies for where you are, just uh, get in the habit of taking those measurements. The other advantage to it too is it will let you know over the time if you compare your results and start to see that you're uh, maybe uh, seeing a harmonic increase or something changing. Okay, one of the other things I like to tell people is pick a level. I don't care what the level is, but uh, audio specifically, if you pick a reference level throughout your entire facility, then troubleshooting, replacing equipment, anything like that gets a whole lot easier because you know exactly what you should see at input and output for the specific level. And again, whether it's analog, digital, 10 dBm, minus 4 dBfs, whatever it happens to be, then uh, having a standard reference level throughout the whole facility will make your job a lot easier. Okay, uh, spare tools, and this is the tool kit out of the back of my truck. You can see that I used a lot of my own materials here. But uh, what you were uh, mentioned quite a bit about that, and I just kept it very brief on this slide. So you want to elaborate, Paul? Yeah, uh, my uh, trunk, I have a Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee. I've got a toolbox in there. I've got the air pump in case I get a flat tire at a tower site. But I also have a nice little knee cushion that when I'm on my knees, whether it be wood or concrete, that uh, I'm not, you know, particularly if I'm going to be down on the floor for a while, I want to have something that I can feel comfortable with when I'm working. And uh, the other things, I don't carry that stuff that you see on the left-hand side there, Jeff. I don't carry any of those liquids around. But I do carry uh, some cheesecloth for air conditioners to duct tape those up, particularly when a lot of the farmers are harvesting so the dust doesn't get into some of the air conditioners. really makes it easy. You can buy that stuff at Walmart. It's called cheesecloth, and it's great for uh, ventilating air conditioners on the outside of it. And I carry a lot of other little things. You mentioned duct tape. I mean, I, if you were to come in, I probably got about 300 things in the back of my truck. But the most important thing is, uh, what do you need? What would you have to have? Would you need a drill? Uh, would you need a saw? Would you need a hammer? Do you have those things? Uh, do you have a pair of pliers? Um, you know, do you have a set of dikes? The things that you need to do your job. And do you have a Boy Scout knife or a, a Swiss Army knife, a utility knife? Not one you keep with you, but one that is going to always be your backup. So always have a backup. And don't forget your flashlights as well. And it uh, looks like a snow shovel or something there. Can't tell what you've got there on that blue handle. That, uh, But uh, in the wintertime, start putting your shovel in there because you may end up having to be somewhere where you're going to need it. Yep. And, I mean, I've got uh, toe straps and various other things that uh, you tend to have up in snow country as well. So lots of lots of good tips, and it will be very very specific based on uh, where you're located. Uh, the cheesecloth, incidentally, is a good idea because that uh, does a really good job of not restricting airflow as well. 
And uh, well, there's uh, another good suggestion from Dave Yule out in uh, Western Canada. Put your uh, AC connection on a, pull the AC connection to your UPSs on a regular basis to make sure your UPS still works because nothing worse than having backup source of power not work when you need it. Uh, same like testing your generator, and we'll get to that in a bit too. Uh, updates to software. The big thing I tell people is years ago, and uh, I see a few of our older customers here, uh, more experienced customers here, uh, but uh, going back far enough, used to be we'd send out a Ziploc bag with a sheet of paper for instructions and assorted uh, parts and cut this track and swap this capacitor and uh, change this resistor to this value. Nowadays, a lot of that stuff is done with software updates. So we can change bias levels, we can adjust fan speeds, we can do all this stuff with software. So when we release a software update, at the very least, even if you don't install it, take a look at the release notes and make sure that it doesn't have any impact on something you need to do. Okay, I'm told we're running low on time, we know this, so uh, we're gonna have to pick up the pace a little, Paul, but engineering data, this comes back to your logbook. Well, the real, the most important thing is put the TPO on the front of your transmitter with a label maker because that's one of the things that the uh, engineers look at when they walk in and uh, they also like to see the specs of the transmitter to see that you're 7.7 .7 or 2.40 or whatever it happens to be that you got on the front of the transmitter does in fact uh, meet the uh, uh, FCC's, uh, the, the uh, manufacturer's uh, output of the transmitter. Little stuff like that really makes a lot of difference uh, in impressing people, but it also keeps you up to date on it. So, Right. And uh, this is just a slide to remind you that uh, it's if you've got a WISE cam, they're, uh, they're cheap, they're easy to install, they're IT accessible, and they'll let you know that you uh, left the door open in a blizzard, for example. Um, so it's just a good idea to have something, if you've got a site that's hard to get to, at least it'll let you know if something's going wrong. Uh, let me say one thing to you. Let me say one thing to you about that. Uh, yeah. That shovel, uh, lots of times you can't get into the building because the snow is four or five or six or seven inches high, and you have to shovel that out before you can open the door, and the door freezes first, and then to get the snow gets on it. So right. the next slide that you're looking at, these are the manuals that, uh, these aren't mine, but this is a great su suggestion. Make sure you got a manual with every piece of equipment that you've got. So it really yeah, makes yeah, it easy. Yeah. I found that many engineers want to spread out a uh, schematic on the floor, and that's one of the reasons that I like the paper and I, more so than I do uh, a USB. But so whatever the engineer wants to do, we'll do it. Right, right. It's just, it's convenient and it works well. Okay, uh, remote access, uh, by all means, if you've got the ability, having a backup method of uh, getting audio out to the site and control, whether it's a wireless IP bridge, these days those things have come down in price so much that it's uh, really hard to uh, not have a reason to have some backup audio source. Sometimes you just don't have the ability, but if you can do it, uh, you know, it's a good thing to have. Now, Paul, you talked a lot about capital budgets, and uh, that's something that a lot of us tend not think about because we're used to just fixing stuff as it breaks. Every engineer needs to have some idea of what you need for the future. And if you're not talking to your station owner, station manager, please sit down and have that conversation with them and let them know these are the things that other radio stations are doing. They're going to this technology, and I need you to know that this is what it's going to cost, this is what it's for, this is how long it's going to take to install it. And by the way, this by going to the new stuff, we also have the old stuff that we can keep as a backup. So it's just some stuff that where you sit down and you have a suggestion uh, or a strong recommendation of some of the things that you need or will need. And by the way, speaking of needs, if you need uh, soldering irons, if you need those kinds of things, little stuff, I mean, it can be anything, ask the station manager if he will pay for it or if she will pay for it. And here's why. They like to do things for their engineer. They really do. And to say, hey, here's a list of some supplies I need. Would you mind if the station took care of them for me? Or you could say it like this. Here, these are some supplies that I need. Uh, is there any reason the station couldn't take care of it? Because it's it's actually for the station. You know, so just some things that I share with you. So, Good point. Now, 
on the uh, backup section or the backup frame of mind, uh, one of the things that uh, we uh, also see is that uh, a lot of gear these days has multiple audio sources. And so there are ways, depending on whose gear you've got, that you can chain stuff together to have multiple auto signals or audio signals with uh, automatic switching. So it's a useful tool to have. Uh, Paul, you'd also talked about combination locks instead yeah, of Yeah, this is uh, something that we use. I talked about it a moment ago uh, when I don't think you were able to hear us, but um, that's how we do, that's how we lock up all of our equipment. I do have uh, keys that go into the door, by the way, and all of our keys are key to the same, so I never have to worry about uh, losing my keys. I've always got a spare, and uh, yep, there is a key hidden, but I can't tell you where it is. Yep, yep, good to know. And uh, oh, sorry, flip back real quick. Uh, the note about putting a piece of rubber, like an inner tube or something. Over oh the wall yeah, I forgot it. about that. I'm glad you Just brought that up. I, yeah. I went over to the. I go to the car dealer. Uh, excuse me. I go to the tire place, and I learned this from WTUZ up in um, Ohio, and uh, they were up in a real icy, snowy place, and he had his a combination lock covered with a piece of uh, rubber tire and uh, inner, an, inner, an inner tube. So we cut it out and we started using that with a couple of those bread clips and that keeps the uh, moisture from getting on top of the lock, makes it easier to open and you don't have to worry about it because I don't have Sealy, I don't have anything at the bottom, but those are good to buy. The most important thing is keeping your locks dry and uh, not letting them get wet and freeze. Yep, good point. Okay, now going back sort of the very first slide we were talking about uh, cooling requirements, uh, an extension of that is uh, power consumption, current draw. So we can uh, figure out what size breaker. So this slide just uh, gives you the basic math on that. And again, this will all be archived so you can find that later. Now, Paul, you do quite a bit of talking about uh, the best ways to uh, make sure you get your stuff back. If I ever have anything to break and I'm sending it back to the factory, I'm putting a, I'm putting our name on it, but I'm also putting a bumper sticker on there, and I'm putting the office manager's card, her business card, and if it's an RMA that's required, I put that on there. You label it up. You can always take the label off. You can pull the card out, but I lost a piece of equipment one time, and uh, they couldn't find it. It was my fault because I didn't do my due diligence that I'm doing now. Tape a business card to whatever it is you're shipping out. Make sure you got your name on it. Put a bumper sticker on it. You know, I, all ours leave here with a Tennessee Vols bumper sticker. Sorry, folks. But that's what we do. And um, people don't forget these things. Nobody else does it, by the way, until you folks start doing it. Yep, so it's a really good point to have. And from the manufacturer side, having the RMA on the box makes a difference, too. Uh, IP security over and above that, if you're networking, which almost everybody is, Depending on your type of network, a lot of them, like Windows networks, tend to give new users full level access. And DJ doesn't need access to the traffic network, for example, as a rule. So break up your domains and restrict access as much as you can. Okay, uh, one other note that uh, Aaron's throwing all kinds of notes at me here. Uh, I'm gonna have to put them on the payroll or something. But uh, he mentioned with the locks that uh, he, uh, and uh, George mentioned the same thing, carrying a, a small torch for uh, getting into frozen locks. So just something else to, to be you, my, mindful of. And uh, this one, I love this one. So uh, I'm gonna let Paul talk to this one, but I don't think there's anybody on this webinar that wouldn't agree with this. Yeah, you gotta have conversations. And sometimes it's better just go to Wendy's, McDonald's, or out to your favorite restaurant and have a conversation about what's going on. Um, you know, an extra tank of gas, um, card meal. If you're an engineer, you know, it's a great place to go out and say, hey, let's go get a bite to eat. Most of the time, I would say all the time, the, the manager should take care of your meal if you're an engineer. But I also like to say this, you know, I like to do things for engineers because they keep me on the air. And um, there's nobody that's any more important to me when the radio station goes off than the engineer. It doesn't make any difference uh, what's going on. I'm, I've had to go get my engineer at his house because his car was broken down and took him to the tower, got us back on, took him back home. You know, I'm, I'm just real sensitive to you folks who do engineering and I'd be your best manager, I promise, if you were working for us. 
Sounds like you might be uh, looking for looking for backup. So we talked about generator maintenance. Here's a, a list of the basic things. The one thing that we don't mention here is that you absolutely, absolutely must test your generator under full load on a regular basis. Because the generator that's not, and, and that would include transfer switches, uh, just go in and pull the power to the site and make sure the generator comes up and flips over. Uh, but uh, unless you've uh, unless you've tested it, you just don't know it's going to work. Okay. Now, Paul, you uh, talked about remote van, and we're running fast on time, so we're going to high speed now. Yeah, this is ours. Um, you, if you're a manager or an engineer, walk around, take a quick look, see what it looks like, make sure that the um, air and the tires are what they're supposed to be. But the one thing also. Uh, Make sure that the gear is taken care of and remind staff that when they're borrowing a Marty or a tie line or a Comrex or whatever they're doing their live action broadcast with, make sure they understand the value of those boxes. If it's, you know, $3,000, $4,000 and even the, the Yagi. And that's another thing I want to point out. We still do a lot of broadcast on our Marty and you need to make sure that the staff understands those things are dangerous weapons. We've got to make sure people aren't coming up and touching the, the ring antenna or that that uh, Yagi is not secured properly. And cords also uh, can cause people to hurt, get hurt and um, <clears throat> take you off the air, take your transmitter and pull it off the table and those kinds of things. So just a little something there to remind engineers and managers about how to take care of what's going on when it's not at the radio station. Uh, that's a really good point. Uh, shorting stubs, I wrote an article about this uh, a couple of years ago, so you can certainly go back to our archives and find that. Um, you'd made a good point putting headphones in freezer bags and uh, bagging things up just to keep them in better condition. Yeah, one of the things you got to do, you got to look at your equipment. If you're in charge of play-by-play um, -play or live action broadcast, but if you ultimately are the engineer, you know you need to look at all the stuff and see what kind of shape it's in, and report that to the owner or the manager. So let them know, hey, these people aren't taking care of stuff, or you know, I saw headphones look pretty bad. They're going to have to have some here before too long. And I've been using freezer bags for a long time to keep things separated because you can see right through them. You know exactly what's in the bag. And usually they've got the little white patch on them, so you can label them if you need to too. So. Okay, uh, one other thing on uh, protective equipment for safety. I beat the drum on shock resistant or electro hazard rated footwear over and over and over. And until I see everybody at a transmitter site wearing it, I'll keep beating that drum. It's relatively cheap to get and it's a really good idea to have. Uh, so that way you just don't, uh, you know, just sooner or later you're going to get across something. And if it doesn't kill you, that's a whole lot better, you know. Um, for what it's worth. Now, uh, Paul, I, I really like this because this is something I beat the drum on, not working alone when possible. And uh, most wrote, engineers do, and you talk about owners going out with them. Yeah, I read a story many years ago about uh, the station manager. This is important, folks. Station manager, was uh, they were off the air, and the station manager kept going back to the engineer. And he said, hey, man, how long is it going to be? How long is it going to be? Now, you folks have heard all of this before. But this kept going on and on and on. And the next thing you know, manager goes back to his office and the guy's back there in the transmitter and he gets a little bit tired and he gets really tired and he ended up screwing it up and uh, and he didn't leave the transmitter room uh, walking out. And that's the kind of thing managers have to have patience. And it's always good if you're out there working at two o'clock in the morning to have somebody with you. And if you don't and you think you're Mr. or Ms. Invincible, you're not. You need to have somebody, if it's your husband or your wife or your son or daughter or somebody, maybe a disc jockey, but have somebody with you to take care of making sure both of you aren't going to get in trouble. Yeah, really good idea. Uh, one other thing about air conditioners real quick is uh, don't oversize them because they may not pull enough humidity, especially the folks in the deep south. Uh, that can be a really big issue, so do make sure you size them properly. Okay, uh, we're getting near the end. I don't know how much time, extra time Ed allotted us. I hope a couple of minutes, but uh, if we cut off, I apologize now. Uh, Paul, what do you want to speak to uh, the voluntary inspection programs? It's the best thing that ever happened to our company. And because 
even though our engineer is a really good person, you know, there are some times that they are get things overlooked. This will have somebody to put some teeth into what goes on. And every uh, alternate broadcast inspection engineer that I have met, they have been super about working with engineers. They want to make sure things are there. And basically, it just boils down to one thing, having somebody to look over your shoulder and to say, hey, you forgot to do this, or are you doing this? I love these things, and I'm proud to tell you that we've got our certificates hanging on the wall. Commission walks in. They can see that. They can turn around and walk away, or but they can still come out and go to my tower and look at that, and they can also ask us to run an EAS. So don't think it's going to give you the clearance just because your EAS box is broken and you haven't gotten it fixed in the last six months that you still can't to get a fine because you can. So make sure you're taking care of your stuff, and these people will help you to do it. And if you're one of these people that does this, God bless you, because if you're doing it the right way, you're going to make radio broadcasters better. Excellent. I'll, I'll talk about these a lot. Uh, anybody that's got to connect anything to a D connector, these are the handiest little device for those of us that are getting a little older and it's harder to see to solder uh, D connectors or hands aren't as steady as they used to be. They're, uh, they're just a really handy little tool. There are other companies out there too. These just happen to be the ones I'm familiar with at the moment. I'll, uh, Paul, this is Tip number 50, this is to wrap it up, and uh, this is maybe one of the best things that I've ever heard. Uh, we have an attorney in Washington. He's very expensive. All Washington attorneys are, though. But the most important thing is play by the rules. Make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to. Don't lie. You know, don't fudge it. If the light's out, you know, the light's out. Get things fixed. And if you ever have a question, don't hesitate to call your lawyer because or your FCC attorney because those are the guys that are paid handsomely to keep your license in check and the most important thing an owner or a manager owns is the license and the license sometimes is kind of in the hands of a lot of different people the disc jockey the engineer other people so you know respect what you have and be glad you have it because if you don't have a license you don't have a job very very good now, I've been taking the questions as we go. There were a couple I haven't touched. Uh, Leon had mentioned that uh, chemical heat packs uh, work better than torches for uh, warming locks, and that's a really good idea. Melt the uh, ice out without uh, risk and damaging the, the mechanism of the lock. And uh, I think Dave, it was, had asked about the most uh, current GV software. If you go to our website and click the support button, under resources, you'll see latest software, and from there you can scroll down and uh, see the software and release notes for any specific piece of equipment. I'll go through the question list later. I think I got them all. If I missed anything, I will respond by email. We do have other places. As I said, the uh, webinars do get archived, and uh, we have a YouTube channel and the Waves newsletter, of course. At this point, I'd really like to thank Paul Tinkle. I know you're a busy fella. I know we uh, we talk quite a bit, and I really want to thank you for uh, coming in and providing the uh, the management viewpoint of this. Thanks for letting me do that, Jeff, and to all you engineers. God bless you. Stay safe. Do the things that you know are right, and don't take any chances. And make sure your owner or your manager knows what you're doing and when you're doing it. And if you've done something that uh, is going to make him proud, or maybe you're just doing a job, do a good report. And just tell them either where they email it or verbalize it. If you email it, by the way, or if you write it down and say, here, here's a quick look at what we've been doing over the last uh, 60 days, let them have it so they've got a paper trail. And if you're really, really good at what you do, you know, be proud of it and put it in writing and tell the folks uh, who write your paycheck, these are the things that you've been doing for them. Just because you're on a retainer or because you get paid every month to do uh, blankety, blankety, blank. Let them know what you've been doing and give them some observations. Maybe they you tell them in three years we're going to have to have the tower painted, or it may very well be that, hey, in two years we're going to have to have a new transmitter. Whether we want to spend the money or not, I'm preparing you for it. Those are the good communication things that you'll have. And if you document, 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 I guarantee you, you'll cover your butt, and you don't ever have to worry about somebody questioning about the integrity that you have when you're at a tower site all by yourself or inside a transmitter, or maybe you're just walking through the radio station. You know what to look for. You know what to see. You know what to do.
but the most important thing is to tell somebody else what you've been doing. Have a blessed afternoon, everybody, and it's great to be on this with you, and thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you again, Paul, and uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And this is Jeff Welton signing off. Paul Tinkle, I'm going to go 10-7. Bye-bye.